Hello comrades and welcome back to another episode of Ashanka Show, stories about life in the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. My name is Sergei and back in July of 1971, 50 years ago, as we record this video, I was born in the USSR. Меня зовут Сергей, я родился в Советском Союзе. The topic of today's video is Soviet agriculture. And I will explain you what is the difference between Kalhoz, collective farm, and Sovhoz, Soviet farm. So we'll have to begin with the lesson of Russian language. Rok Ruskova Yazika. Kalhoz. Kalhoz. Kalhoz is actually clipping for kolektivne hazaistva, just like a word sitcom is a clipping for situation comedy. Kalhoz is short form or clipping for kolektivne hazaistva. Popular translation of kolektivne hazaistva kalhoz is collective farm, but hazaistva it's has more meaning just farm. We didn't really didn't use the word farm firma back then. So I would translate hazaistva as a homestead. So this is kolektivne hazaistva, collective homestead. The next word is savhoz, savhoz just like kalhoz, savhoz is a clipping for sovietskaya hazaistva, soviet homestead, sovietskaya hazaistva, savhoz. Okay, so what is the difference between kalhoz and savhoz? Collective homestead versus soviet homestead. Let's start with savhoz. So soviet homestead belonged to the state. So people who worked at the savhozes they were paid, just like workers at the factories. They'll come, they work, they get paid cash. And of course, after they done, they retire, they'll get pension based on their salary. Besides the ownership, uh, most sovkhozes were like a specialized agriculture enterprises. So for example, sovkhoz in my dad's village uh, was specializing in hops. So that was pretty much Khmilnoy Savhoz. They were specializing in raising hops and nothing else. So we had Savhozes like milk Savhozes, they're specializing in milk production, pig Savhozes, grape Savhozes, and stuff like that. While collective farms usually were like self sufficient farms or homesteads, so they grew all kind of different crops and had different animals to support its own activity. For example, uh, the kalhoz in my grandparents' village on my mother's side, so in northern Ukraine, uh, they grew everything. They grew corn just to cut it down uh, so they could feed animals in the winter, so for animal feed. They had potato field, they had wheat, and they had orchard uh, for apples, they had their own windmill, they had a small milk farm, they had small chicken farm, so collective farm kind of was doing everything. And then, of course, like my grandfather worked there at their uh, blacksmith shop. So he was uh, fixing horses, you know, putting their horseshoes on. So they had the Kanyushnya, a little uh, horse farm, So because they, they used a lot of horses and stuff like that. So collective farm kind of had everything to be self-sufficient and Savkhoz, Soviet farm was specialized in a specific product. Many uh, Soviet farms, sovkhozes, were created after the revolution of 1917, after the Soviet government confiscated large estates. They kicked out uh, large land owners and sovkhozes were created. So it will be some estate in Crimea growing grapes. So then we'll have a grape sovkhoz. Kalhoze, collective farms or collective uh, homesteads were created later, mostly in the end of 1920s, early 30s, during a forced collectivization under Comrade Stalin. And that's why the peasants were forced to join, pretty much like a cooperative. Uh, you bring your horses, your cows, your pigs, and you uh, work together in this collective farm and this cooperative pretty much. So everyone owns everything and no one owns anything. And you work together and then you sell crops to the government 
and then you split the profits. And the idea of this such a cooperatives, you know, collective farmers of kibbutz, like they call them in Israel, it sounds really good on paper, and it looks good on paper, but when you apply it to real life, to real people, I keep on repeating that socialism is ideal system for ideal people, but unfortunately there's not enough ideal people to support the system. So collective farms, it sounded like a great idea, but there is a two problems with the collective farming. Problem number one, as I mentioned earlier, people. You force someone to work and take care of no one's horses and take care of no one's cows, they will never do as good job as taking care of their own horse or their own pigs. So that creates the problem. And the second problem is the government or the state. So the system is designed, collective farm produces crops and sells it to the government. So you have a pretty much monopoly, right? You have only one customer. There's no competition. So collective farm cannot sell to anyone else. So whatever prices uh, are set by government, that's the prices that collective farm will get. And guess what? In order to keep uh, grocery prices low for the workers in the cities, government was paying bare minimum or sometimes even below the cost of producing the goods. So that's why collective farms quite often had no money to pay to their workers, to kalhozniki, and the people were paid with wheat, with hay, and just basically like barter. You uh, work all year at the collective farm and you'll get uh, two bags of wheat to make bread and some hay uh, to feed your cows and some straw. The situation dealing between collective farms and the government uh, was shown pretty well in a book called Red Plenty. I'm planning to make a review of that book, but it basically kind of shows the whole picture why collective farms were struggling while the people were so poor. It's because the government dictated extremely low wholesale prices because they wanted to uh, keep the city folk happy. And if you follow my channel, uh, you should remember I made several videos about my distant relative. Uh, her first name was Nila, and she worked all her life as a milkmaid. And she was milking cows and taking care of calf in the village of my grandparents. And I showed this uh, her workbook, and she was required to work specific amount of days a year, it's like the law. You must work like in some cases 200 days per year regardless. And in many cases she wasn't paid uh, or paid very little, although she worked almost every day of the year. So of course, if you don't get paid, uh, how you can get money to buy clothing, you know, salt, sugar and other items, because like our collective farm didn't raise uh, you know, beets to make sugar and stuff like that. So peasants were extremely poor, despite that they were worked extremely hard pretty much all year round. So the big picture, it was way better for the uh, village people to work at Savhoz instead of Kalhoz because they had a guaranteed salary. They were getting paid for their work and they didn't have to worry about, will I get any money in the end of the year or they're just gonna give me, you know, several bags of potatoes and wheat for my hard labor. So Safhoz was a better uh, option uh, for the peasants. Also, when you retire, uh, your pension uh, was based on how many years you work and also how much was your salary. I'm gonna make a separate video about pensions. I'm getting ready for that one. But if you were a collective farm worker and you were being paid in goods like for example my grandmother uh, she got the minimal pension available because on paper she was never paid for all the years she worked at our collective farm so her pension was only 12 rubles per month and i found out actually some collective farm workers got even less they had eight rubles per month for 12 rubles you can buy three bottles of vodka so picture your pension like uh, $40 a month after working all your life and not getting paid. So if you'll be driving through the Soviet countryside, you would never tell the difference if you're driving through the collective farm or 
a Soviet farm, but for the people who worked at those places, Savhoz was way better deal. They got paid, they had guaranteed salary, while a collective farm worker was... It was a bad deal for to be a collective farm worker. Okay, my friends, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video, maybe learned something new. As always, don't forget to like it. Uh, I always like to read your comments, so please post your comments, and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. shoot me email if you would like to have a signed copy thank you and if you love my channel and would like to show your support please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Oshanka show